Hello and welcome to Katie Draws. This is a show where I do a lot of speed painting and I'm drawing goddesses and heroines from all across the globe. Nice to see you again or nice to meet you, one or the other. Today we are talking about, we are actually on part four. So if you haven't watched any of the other parts, you might want to. Although this might not be a bad place to start because today we are going to give a brief overview. I say brief because it's very complex. The more I'm diving into Tibetan history, the more my brain wants to explode. There's just so much going on. So today I'm going to go and do a brief overview, very brief, hopefully, comparatively. Like we could have multiple classes on Tibetan history, but I'm going to try to do an overview of ancient Tibetan history as it applies to the Syringma sisters or around that period of time. I'm not going to be going through more modern day or probably post 1600. Not only are we going over Tibetan history today, we are going to briefly talk about the fourth Syringma sister. Her name is Tingyi Shaldrangzangma. I have a photo up just to point this, point it out. I'm not sure which side. Anyway, so we were gonna, we are gonna talk about her and that's gonna be, we are on part four of five. So let's get started. You may not know it, but the history of Tibet is supremely rich in some cases well argued and not entirely documented. We are going to go over a particular period of time called the Yarlung Dynasty. So that means we're going to be talking about 7th century Tibet. Originally, the land was dominated by a bunch of warring clans. In some regions, they were semi-nomadic raiding clans. These clans had few material and cultural exchanges due to the climate, the topography, and distance between each other. That's how harsh the Tibetan Plateau really is. Many of the clans were located in a particular network of valleys and had little in common with other clans. Early Tibetans didn't have much contact with the outside world. If you take a look at the map, you'll see the wide range of the Himalayan mountains. Not only that, there were giant dynasties all around them. The land was harsh and hard to travel through for foreigners. Though, there are a few instances in ancient Chinese texts where they appear, more so when the Tibetan Empire began to grow. This was because of a Yarlung tribal chieftain named Namri Songsten. This was around 600 CE. Namri Songsten became the leader of several Yarlung clans. He did this by using shepherd warriors. He subdued in the neighboring tribes one after another. This led to a huge expansion, which included almost all of modern Tibet. He began to establish a strong centralized state with troops who gained experience in their many battles. A lot of people don't realize how much war and conquest was done in Tibet by Tibetans pre 7th and 8th century. So lots of shit happens. And if you are into the details of proto-Tibetan warfare, I highly suggest looking at the YouTube video I have linked down below in the description for more details. At any rate, someone assassinated Namri Songsten by poison, 
which left his 13-year-old son in charge of Tibet. Can you imagine being 13 and having a whole country left on your shoulders? And those shoes are huge to fill. The kid's name is Songsten Gampo, the 33rd king of Tibet and the founder of the Tibetan Empire. This guy is somebody you have to remember. Some say that Songsten Gampo is a manifestation of Avalokiteshvara, of whom the Dalai Lamas are similarly believed to be a manifestation. Like I said, Songsten is very important, and we could talk about his accomplishments in history forever, so I'm going to summarize what he did for Tibet during his reign. A big one was creating a Tibetan script, which became the foundation of the classical Tibetan spoken and written language of Tibet. He introduced Buddhism to the Tibetan people, and he built some of the oldest Buddhist temples that you can visit today. Songsten is considered to be one of the Dharma kings. He also made the Tibetan Empire larger by conquering surrounding clans and people with very large armies. All right, now, Songsten Gampo had six consorts. Yes, you heard me, six. Four were native, and the other two are more well-known, and they are technically foreign. One is Bikruti, a Nepalese princess, and the other is Wen Cheng, the Chinese princess from the Tang dynasty. Both of these princesses were Buddhist and definitely attributed to Songsten's strong affinity towards Buddhism. Wang Chen actually brought a Buddhist statue with her and Songsten dies. After being able to show the might of the Tibetan Empire, he dies. His child was only three years old, so somebody else had to take over, and his name is Gar Tongsten, who was the minister who served Songsten. The Buddhist faith didn't hold, but it was still there. Gar Tongsten continues to conquer more land outside of Tibet, including places where there are Buddhist monasteries. This is important to note because the Tibetan people hadn't received the hold on the Buddhist religion like we see today. There are still differing and stronger belief systems, including being a fairly aggressive warfare-like country and people. It's said that they burned these temples down. Speaking of warfare, there's a lot of stuff that happens between this time, 650 AD through 750 AD. Tibet becomes a melting pot of cultures from India, the Turks, China, so many people come in contact with Tibet. Monks from China are expelled from there and they actually take refuge in Tibet. A smallpox breakout happens and a lot of people are unhappy with the refugees to the point where they drive them out of Tibet. Not all of them, but a lot of them. The empress at that time was very Buddhist, but she actually passed. Ministers of clans in Tibet are still fighting over who gets to rule over the country and how it is ruled. That includes murdering another one of the dynasty's emperors. His name is Mei Aksum. 
and he is the father of a, another important figure in Tibetan history, Trisong Detson. He is also known as the second of the three Dharma kings of Tibet. He is the one who invites Padmasambhava and others. This emperor played a pivotal role in the introduction of Buddhism to Tibet and the establishment of the Nyingma or ancient school of Tibetan Buddhism. So now, Padmasambhava's job was to tame the local spirits and impress the local Tibetans with his magical and ritual powers. Tibet is still very superstitious to this day, and they have always relied on rituals and magic, astrology, etc. The Tibetan sources then explain how Padmasambhava identified the local gods and spirits, called them out, and threatened them with his powers. After they had been tamed, they were forced and told that they would have to vow to protect Buddhism. Padmasambhava was also said to have taught various forms of tantric Buddhist yoga throughout the land. Now this is where things get a little weird. The old Bun religion is theorized to be closely associated with royal families at the time including the kings. There were ceremonies to ensure the well-being of the country, guard against evil, protect the king, enlist the help of spirits in, Tibet, in Tibet's military ventures, all of that. And those were clearly very important to the local Tibetans. There's even some argument that a few emperors, including Trison Detson, that required the conversion of all Tibetan people to convert to Buddhism, or they would be purged. This is still well argued between historians. Regardless, we do see inner conflict within Tibet regarding Buddhism. There is an anti-Buddhist emperor named Lang Dharma who was murdered by either a monk or a Buddhist practitioner, both were Buddhist, which actually ends the entire Yarlung dynasty. And that's where Tibetan history moves into what we call the era of fragmentation. This is a low point in Tibetan history and full of civil war. And that is around 855 AD. In my opinion, through all of this historical knowledge, some things that I think potentially have happened is that Buddhism and the old Bun religion or the indigenous religion in Tibet ended up intermingling from the first Dharma king, Songsten. And some people, it was easy to integrate together some people were not okay with it, some people converted, but it's a hundred years of history that passed be between Songston and Detson. Ultimately, probably both parties took part in violence and probably killed unnecessarily, believing so firmly in their faiths, it's hard to side with one or the other. But I know that the bun today is much different than the old bun religion, and it probably reflects more on old indigenous Buddhist belief systems versus what the cl royal clans used to believe in. But back to the goddesses. So we are going to bring in Tingi Shalzangma. So the Syringma sisters were some of those spirits who were tamed by Padmasambhava, or we also call him Guru Rinpoche. They were actually tamed twice, once by Rinpoche and then the other time 
by another disciple of Buddhism, Milarepa. So I wonder if it might reflect on the history between the Buddhists and the Bun. It's possible that Milarepa comes later because he's trying to reinforce the Buddhist faith across the land. That is a story for another time. Tingi Shalzangma is the goddess of youthful beauty and love. She appears in a blue body and holds a silver mirror in the banner of the gods. Tinky Shalzangma rides on a mare and her main specialty is to restore one's youthful glow and beauty, making you attractive and pleasant in the eyes of others. Tingi Shalzangma brings harmony in relationships, increases the attractiveness and complexion of one's face. She is highly respected as a guardian of the East. Invite her and her sisters into your home to bring helpful friends in your life. I felt inspired by Tingi in my drawing. I wanted to maintain some of the aspects from ancient Tibetan art. She seems to be surrounded by gorgeous light pink clouds, intends to be confident and sure of herself. It was hard to fit her mare into this photo, as you can probably tell. I spent a lot of time on it and I wanted to move on a little further so I figured I would do a little bit of a cheat and bury his hooves under the clouds. Also mares tend to be large so I wanted to make sure to still showcase my goddess Tingi but also be able to showcase her steed. I hope you enjoy. I hope I didn't confuse you because as I've been studying a lot of Tibetan history, the more I've become confused. There are a lot of contradicting opinions, there's a lot of different stories, some there's commonalities, but we do see a lot of people who believe certain things or don't believe certain things. Obviously there's overlaps on who's written the historical texts, who haven't, and you know, unsure of who who the victims are who aren't or if everybody's somewhat guilty of a lot of these things that have happened um and we are still seeing today some uh conflict in tibet so you know there's a lot of intriguing aspects there for sure i know that i probably have gotten some of this information wrong i totally admit it and i'm more than happy to learn more things if people have any any resources at all that they can direct me to to correct any of the mistakes I might have made I will definitely read it and I will make sure to change this video up however necessary but for now th this is the information that I have been able to gather about Tibetan history so in two weeks we are going to go over our fifth and final Syringma sister goddess she is the she is the one her name is Tashi Syringma, I believe, and I'm just really excited. We're also going to be learning more about the Sherpa people because they are very important and they are the people that still to this day, they're the ones that help a lot of the tourists anytime you go to Mount Everest. They're probably the ones that are going to lead you up there. They have migrated over to the Himalayas and made a home there and I can't wait to learn more about their culture and the people so stay tuned for that. If you guys are enjoying any of these videos make sure to like and subscribe and to share with your friends. Uh, that really helps me a lot. If you enjoy my art and you want to check out some more stuff you can come find me on Instagram and I have a website at katiedraws.com Everything is Katie Draws. I'd love to see you there. Let's have a conversation. If there's a goddess or a heroine you want to learn more about, 
make sure to comment, send me a message, whatever you want. I will definitely dig into it because I love learning about all this stuff and I want to share all of this knowledge with you. Thanks again for tuning in and I will see you next time.